Shalom Hadavarnix. Welcome to our next session here at Hadavar Messianic Ministries at our School of Biblical and Jewish Studies. We are working our way through the material on the Messiah and the Tabernacle, Exodus chapter 25 through 30. So we're in the beginning of our study. We're in Exodus chapter 25. I hope to finish Exodus 25 this session. We'll see how it goes, however. All right, let's take a quick review of where we were last session. Last session, we were exploring the significance of the tablets of the law that were contained inside or stored inside the Ark of the Covenant. We saw that the historical significance consisted of the ancient Near Eastern covenant form. The Mosaic Covenant follows this ancient Near Eastern covenant form. It begins with a preamble identifying the king. The second, uh, the second step, or the second part of the Near Eastern covenant form is the historical prologue. This outlines the benefits the king has provided for the subjects. Then the stipulation section. This, this section tells the subjects what is expected of them. Fourthly, we have a provision for deposit. One tablet or one covenant was put in the, the, um, te uh, the temple of the king and another was put in the temple of the, of the subjects for uh, a, a periodic review. Then we came to the list of witnesses that ratified the covenant and then the curses for disobedience to the covenant and blessings for obedience, obedience to the covenant. And so this is exactly the form that the Mosaic covenant takes. Then we looked at the messianic significance of the tablets of the law. We saw that the Mosaic covenant reminds us of a better covenant to come, the new covenant. And I illustrated that using a couple of cars. Here was a beautiful old restored Model T Ford. And there's nothing wrong with this Model T Ford but it will not take you the 200,000 miles that ex expected of modern cars. It's obsolete, too weak for modern transportation needs. And the comparison is the Mosaic Covenant. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not adequate. It has its failings and it is obsolete. And so we don't need, we don't need uh, this, uh, this Model T Ford. Although it's a beautiful automobile, it became obsolete sometime in the past when, when speed limits changed and it continues to be obsolete in the present time. So again, uh, we shouldn't be looking for this old car to meet our transportation needs. What we need is a new car. And here is a current Ford Mustang. This current Ford Mustang will take you the 200,000 miles expected of modern cars and at 55, 65, 75, 85 miles an hour if you wanna go that fast. So it's based on better engineering and a better design. It is not obsolete. And that's the analogy with the New Covenant. The New Covenant is based on better promises and it cannot become obsolete. When did the Mosaic Covenant become obsolete? Well, we learn that in Luke chapter, two, chapter 22, verse 20. It's Passover AD 30. And we read, and in the same way he took the cup, that's Yeshua, took the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. So he's instituting the new covenant in AD 30. It'll be put into effect with his death and resurrection. So let's summarize the pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenant. First of all, the pot of manna, the pot of miraculous bread from heaven that sustained Israel physically in the wilderness, prefigured the true bread from heaven, Yeshua, who sustains men spiritually. Aaron's rod. The high priest's rod prefigured Yeshua, the greater high priest and messianic king. Remember that rod was a, was a scepter, speaking of a king's royal authority, and, but it was given to Aaron the priest as well. So the messianic king will be both a priest and king. Later revelation to come will detail that. Then the tablets of the covenant. The tablets representing the Mosaic covenant prefigured the better covenant the new covenant. Then our attention was now turned to the atonement cover, the lid on the covenant box right here. It's often called the mercy seat. I prefer the term atonement cover because this is where the atonement occurred on Yom Kippur. The high priest would enter the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrifices and he would sprinkle it before the mercy seat and on the mercy seat. 
And this is where God would be reconciled to Israel once a year on Yom Kippur. Next are the, uh, the text explored the meaning of the cherubim that were on top of the mercy seat, the atonement cover. And we saw that they were God's glorious throne attendants. Now Ezekiel got a look at the real cherubim in his vision of the divine chariot and the throne. And so the cherubim on the mercy seat are simply a shadow and a copy of the true cherubim around the throne. All right, well, this brings us to the new material for our class today. We're at Exodus chapter 25, 22, and we're going to look at the purpose, the purpose of the mercy seat. Exodus 25, 22. There, God says, there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat and between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony. And I will speak to you about all that I give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. So here, above the Ark of the Covenant, above the mercy seat, between the cherubim is where the Shekinah glory would appear and God would meet with his people. And it's amazing to me, amazing to me that an absolutely omnipotent, all-knowing, all-merciful, um, in incredible person, God, so far above us, would want our fellowship and want a relationship with his people. But you know, he has said that consistently throughout scripture. For example, Levitic Leviticus 26, 11 through 22. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul will not reject you. And I will also walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. God wants a relationship with his people. And so we learn now as we, um, have moved through verse 20, 22, that Moses is creating a throne room and a, uh, he's re creating a throne room and a palace and a palace. All right, well, let's continue on here. What is the historical significance of the mercy seat? Well, it's the place where the king of kings would meet with his people and deal with their sins. The ark was the footstool of the throne of God where the presence of God would be visibly seen between the cherubim. We saw this, or we see this in Psalm 99, one through five as well. Psalm 99, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is what? Enthroned above the cherubim. There he is, enthroned in the Holy of Holies, above the cherubim, and in reality, above his throne attendants as well. Let the earth shake. The Lord, the Lord is great in Zion, and he's exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The strength of the Lord loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. So the, the Ark of the Covenant is the footstool of God Almighty. We also see this in 1 Chronicles 28, 2. King David understood what he was doing. Then King David rose to his feet and said, listen to me, my brethren and my people. I had intended to build a permanent home for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. So I had made preparations to build it. So that was David's, David's uh, goal as well. And so as we continue on looking at the historical significance, this was the place <clears throat> where the sins of Israel were covered over. Le Leviticus 16, verses 14 through 17. And this, of course, happened on the Day of Atonement. Levit Leviticus 16, 14. Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood, with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting, uh, for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, 
no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. So again, this was the place where satisfaction and reconciliation occurred. When the high priest stood before the mercy seat and God poured out his mercy upon Israel, the high priest stood before the atonement cover and God and, and, and atonement was made for the sins of Israel. All right, let's move on to the messianic significance of the mercy seat. First of all, we can come into God's throne room, into the very presence of God because of our relationship with Yeshua. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. There's, there's the admonition for us. So that we may receive mercy and find grace, grace to help in our time of need. So there it is, Yeshua, our great high priest. So we can approach God's throne and worship at his footstool. And someday, someday we'll even get to share his throne as co-rulers. Revelation 3, 5 and 20 indicates this for us. Revelation 3, 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. That's a great privilege. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain, and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. There's all the believers. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And then finally, in chapter 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection, and all of us will have a part in the first resurrection. We are going to be blessed and holy. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Messiah. And well, what will we do? We'll reign with him for a thousand years. So that's exciting news. All right, secondly, messianic significance here. Secondly, the wrath of God, which burned against sin, demanded that punishment be exacted. The appropriate punishment is the death penalty, and that is bad news. That is bad news. However, there is good news. That's what the word gospel refers to. It refers to the good news that God is willing to accept a substitute. And the death of the Messiah was that substitutionary punishment that satisfied the holy demands of a righteous God. Therefore, God is reconciled to the believer. So Yeshua is the substitutionary atoning sacrifice, very clearly stated in 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Yeshua HaMashiach, the righteous. And what? He himself is the propitiation. Whoa, stop, full stop, propitiation, a $10 word we never use these days, do we? What does propitiation mean? Well, I've defined it there for you. It means to appease or to conciliate or the means of forgiveness. So let me just stick the definition in there. He himself is the means of forgiveness for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And Yeshua is also the source of reconciliation, Romans 5, 10 and 11. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. So at this point, I want to re review my principle that we're going to see often. The principle, the common and the ordinary become uncommon and extraordinary when used in the service of the king. 
You know, remember our little U.S. Army footlocker, our little common wooden box, just a tiny little thing, not big, not impressive, not made out of super duper material, just a common wooden box. But the common and the ordinary become extraordinary and uncommon when used in the service of the king. How did this footlocker become extraordinary and uncommon? When it was covered over with gold and when it became the footstool for the king and became the covenant box, the container for the, for the testimony. So the Ark of the Covenant became extraordinary and unusual, uncommon, because it's being used in the service of the king. And the gold specifies very clearly that this is worth a worthy uh, piece of furniture. This, is, this piece of furniture, this box, is in the service of the king. So this is true of inanimate objects, but it al it's also true of people. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31, speaking of you and I. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. We're just all, by and large, we're just all common, ordinary people. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. So God has chosen the common and the ordinary to shame the things which are strong in the world. And then the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So no man can boast before God. So there, there again, we're just common, ordinary folk. But, big word, what have we received? But by his doing, you are in Messiah Yeshua. And what, is he, what has he given us? What have we gathered? What have we, what have we gained by being in Yeshua? who became to us wisdom from God, that's eternal, and righteousness, that is also eternal, and sanctification, we're set apart to serve God eternally, and redemption, we have received eternal gifts, not temporary physical gifts. So, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. My dad has given me the most valuable gifts possible. All right. So some thoughts of application, or I should say one thought of application. Have you been reconciled to God? Now, I don't know who's watching this video and where you are in the world, but I'm sure there's a number of people watching who have not been reconciled to God. But if you feel the need now, the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, and you know you're a sinner, you know you need to be reconciled to God, those sins have to be atoned for and taken care of, Place your faith in Yeshua now. He is your sin bearer. He is the source of reconciliation. By trusting him, by grace through faith plus nothing, you'll receive all the wonderful eternal benefits of eternal life with him. So I would ask you very sincerely now, decide. If you have not been reconciled to God, say yes. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Become my my substitutionary sacrifice, reconcile me to God. I hope, I hope you have done that. Now, I'm gonna show you some ARC illustrations. And with each illustration, I'm going to emphasize my, emphasize my theme, my principle, okay? That the common and the ordinary become uncommon and extraordinary when used in the service of the Lord. There's another rendition of the Ark of the Covenant. The common, and the, unco the common and the extraordinary become uncommon. I, yes, uncommon and extraordinary were used in the service of the king. Did I say that? The, the common and the ordinary become uncommon and extraordinary when used in the service of the king. I hope that is for, hope that becomes the the uh, true of everybody who's ha watching this video. Now I want to take a little rabbit trail and ask a question. The question is, where is the ark today? A lot of people ask that question and wonder. A lot of people looked for it. If you go to Wikipedia, you'll find that there's 11 different rumored locations. Let's take a look at that. First of all, Mount Nebo. Second Maccabees 2, 4 through 10 contains a reference to a document saying that the prophet Jeremiah, being warned by God, before the Babylonian invasion, took the ark 
the tabernacle and the altar of incense and buried them in a cave on Mount Nebo, that's in Jordan, informing those of his followers who wished to find the place that it should remain unknown until the time that God should gather his people again together and receive them unto mercy. So Mount Nebo is one place. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem, that would be a favorite place. According to Hebrew traditions, King Solomon, when building the temple, had the Ark of the Covenant put on a platform which could be lowered down into a tunnel system if the temple were ever overrun. Such overrun did eventually come when King Nebuchadnezzar's troops destroyed the temple and carried off its treasures. But no mention of the Ark of the Covenant was made, possibly because it had been lowered into the cave system below and secretly carried away by the Levite priests. Well, let's go outside of Israel. Aktu Aksum, Ethiopia. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church claims to possess the Ark of the Covenant, or Tabo, in Aksum. The object is now kept under guard in a treasury near the, near the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion and used occasionally on ritual processions. Well, let's continue south in Africa to southern Africa. The Lemba people of South Africa and Zimbabwe have claimed that their ancestors carried the Ark south, calling it the Nguma Ngoma Lugundu, or Voice of God, eventually hiding it in a deep cave in the Dumge Mountains, their spiritual home. Well, leaving Africa, let's head up back to Israel and Negev. Michael Sanders claims to have found the location of the Ark of the Covenant stones in the Harya, near an ancient temple created by Ramses II. Well, leaving Israel, let's head north and go to Europe and settle down here, uh, hover down over Languedoc, France. Several le legends hold that the Ark was carried home to Languedoc by Knights Templar returning from the Crusades. Then let's move north from France to the United Kingdom. In 2003, historical author Graham Phillips traced the route of the Ark through research using biblical text as being taken to Mount Sinai in the Valley of Edom by the Maccabees along with other religious treasures. Phillips claims it remained there until the 1180s when Ralph de Soudoulet, the, the leader of the Templars, who apparently found the Maccabean treasure at Jebel Hamadba, returned home to his estate in Herdewick in Warwickshire, UK, taking the treasure with him. Well, let's continue a little further north to Ireland. During the turn of the 20th century, British Israelites carried out some excavations of the Hill of Tara in Ireland looking for the Ark of the Covenant. The Royal Society of Antiquities of Ireland campaigned successfully to have them stopped before they destroyed the hill. <laughs> And let's go around the world, to the other side of the world, to Shikoku, Japan. I was amazed when I read this. Shikoku, Japan. Local claims exist that the Ark is hidden within limestone caves under Mount Tsurugi. That mountain is the highest one in Shikoku and the second highest in western Japan at 1,955 meters, or 6,413 feet. It has a sacred status in the Shigundu faith, which incorporates elements of Shintoism and Buddhism. The Japanese government bans excavations on the mountain for environmental reasons. And let's get the United States into the act, okay? <laughs> Can't leave the United States out of the act. San Pente County, Utah. Local legends of San Pente County, Utah speak of buried treasures within the earth. One particular belief is that the Ark of the Covenant is presently situated within the San Pete Valley and is protected by three Nephites. In Following the Ark of the Covenant, Ross Carey Boren presents his thesis that the Ark was brought to the Americas by pre-Columbian Jewish immigrants described in the Book of Mormon, and it was subsequently buried in a hill in, present, in the present-day area of San Pete Valley. And you know, even Hollywood has jumped into the act on this thing. This is the movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. At the end of the movie, we have a scene. In Washington, D.C., Army intelligence agents tell Indiana Jones, he's the star of the movie, that the Ark is somewhere very safe and studied to be studied by top men. In reality, 
The Ark is sealed in a wooden crate labeled top secret and stored in a giant government warehouse filled with countless similar crates, never to be found again. <laughs> well, why did I take this rabbit trail off on Ark stories? Well, just to say, don't get caught up in Ark stories. There's plenty of them out there. None of them have ever panned out. More than likely, the Ark of the Covenant was destroyed by the Babylonians when they destroyed the temple in 586. However, if the Ark of the Covenant surfaces and is verified to be the real thing, I will rejoice because that will be the archeological find of the millennium. It would be just great. All right, now it's time to move on through chapter 25. <clears throat> now we come to chapter 25, verses 23 through 30 and the table of showbread. The, descri the description of the table is in Exodus 25, 23 through 27. And so the construction is uh, des described in verse 23. You shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long and one cubit wide and, and one and a half cubits high. So dimensions, three feet long, one and a half wide, one and a half feet wide and two feet high. What, is it, what are we describing here? A coffee table. A common, mundane, ordinary coffee table. What could be less spectacular than that? But this coffee table, although it's common and ordinary, will become uncommon and extraordinary because it will be overlaid with gold and be used in the service of the king. You shall overlay it with pure gold and make a gold border around it. So now, now it is a worthy gift for the king, the best Israel had to offer. Now two moldings of some sort are described uh, as going around the table. No one is quite sure what they are. Verse 25, you shall make for it a rim, a handbreadth around it, and you shall make a gold border for the rim around it. So we don't know exactly what these what these uh, rims were. Now here's the Timna Park model of the showbread, and you can see a rim around that table. And so some think it's an outside rim to keep the, the unleavened bread in place, and then an inner one uh, specifically around the showbread. They haven't got an inner lip here. Now the other idea is that it might be an outer lip to keep the, to keep the items on the table in place, and then a lower leg support to strengthen the legs. So we really don't know exactly what the table looks like. We do know there were accessories for it though, verses 26 through 28. You shall make four gold rings for it and put rings on the four corners which are on its four feet. So it's portable, it has rings and poles for carrying it. The ring shall be close to the rim as holders for the poles to carry the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold so that with them the table may be carried. So here's an illustration of the table of showbread, and of course here are the rings and the poles, and this artist's rendition. And here's another rendition of the table, and again here's the poles and the rings used for carrying them, according to that artist. Now there are other various utensils of highest quality associated with the table. Verse 29, you shall make its dishes and its pans and its jars and its bowls with which to pour drink offerings. You shall make them of pure gold. Now here's the Timna Park model, and you can see they have included some utensils on the table for use with the showbread. Now uh, the Temple Institute, the rabbinical view, understands these words jars and bowls in the NASV to actually describe tubular supports and platforms. And so that's why the Temple Institute comes to this understanding of the table of showbread. However, a more rea uh, realistic understanding is probably found on the Arch of Titus in Rome. This is, the, uh, this is the relief on the arch showing the treasures of the temple being carried out of the temple in Jerusalem. And this is a trumpet table of some sort. Here is the, the colorized version. Archaeologists have colorized the picture with the colors that they've determined uh, were fresh and new when the, when the relief had been was finally finished and brand new and again that is the trumpet table again and following that lead this is a trumpet storage table that the that the temple institute has created 
And so they think that the table of showbread might have followed this same plan. Again, an outer lip at the top to keep the showbread in place, and then some kind of leg support at the bottom to stabilize it. So that's probably a more realistic idea of what the table of showbread looked like. But here again is the rabbinic opinion, the tubular supports and platforms. Now, verse 30, what is the purpose for the table of showbread? You shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me at all times. So the table was there to hold the bread of the presence continually before the, before the Lord. And this bread was unleavened bread. Now the word presence there describes the presence of God. The literal Hebrew is faces. This is the bread of the faces, implying face to face with God. The idea here is eating face to face with somebody, with God in this case, in fellowship. However, the rabbis feel that the, that the terminology refers to the shape of the bread. Bread baked with two surfaces directed at each other. So here is the rabbinic view of the table of showbread, and here are the, here's the bread baked in this C-shaped mold, I guess, so that two faces uh, are opposite each other. And here's another close-up of the showbread according to the rabbis, how they feel, uh, what they feel the text is saying. Bread with two faces opposite each other. However, this is probably a more realistic view of the table of showbread, probably a more realistic view. All right, now the bread is described in Leviticus 24 verses 5 through 9. Then you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an apha shall be on each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six to a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. So the, there's twelve loaves. You shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be a memorial portion for the bread, for even an offering by fire to the Lord. So we've got all these twelve loaves on the table as a memorial portion. Every Sabbath day you shall set it in order before the Lord continually. It is an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. It shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place. For it is most holy to him from the Lord's offerings by fire, his portion forever. So again, here's the table of the showbread. Remember, each tribe is represented, one tribe for one loaf of bread. Every tribe was equal before God, and this is a perpetual offering for the Lord. It's to always be in place. And then it was placed on the table every Shabbat, every Sabbath, and left there until the following Shabbat. And here, this is a picture, the rabbinic view of the table, and the, the priests there are changing the showbread. They're taking the old showbread off and putting the new showbread on. When the loaves were removed, they were eaten by the priests. So the, the Loaves were probably arranged the way you see them here, uh, two stacks, two rows, meaning two stacks, two columns, six, six loaves each. However, the word can be interpreted differently, and here's another rendering of two rows, one made up of one layer of uh, showbread, of unleavened bread side by side, 12 in, in um, total. All right, now, Frankincense. Frankincense was placed on the table and burned either in small piles or perhaps in small bowls alongside the loaves. So here are the frankincense censers that have been prepared by the Temple Institute to burn the incense on the, the um, bread of the, uh, the, on the showbread, the table of showbread. And remember, this is a memorial offering. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that God desires face-to-face -face fellowship with his people. Now in Solomon's temple, uh, the original table was located there, and then Solomon added 10 additional tables of showbread to the right and left of the original one. So here is uh, the account in 2 Chronicles 4.8. He, Shlomo, Solomon, also made 10 tables and placed them in the temple, five on the right side and five on the left, and he made 100 golden bowls. So here's an illustration of the way the rabbis think Solomon's temple was set up. 
Here are the tables of showbread. You can see the original table that was the original one made and standing in the tabernacle at the front there, right in front of the veil. But then the additional tables, the 10 additional tables, five to the right and five to the left on either side of the original table of showbread. So that's the way the rabbis understand uh, 2 Chronicles 4, 8. All right, what's the historical significance of the table of showbread? Well, three historically significant messages are communicated by the table and the items it held. First of all, physical nourishment. Bread was a mainstay of the ancient diet. It's symbolic of man's need for nourishment and food. And Yeshua used the symbol that way. Yeshua used bread as a symbol of nourishment in Matthew 6:11, the Lord's Prayer. He said, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily nourishment, our daily needs, Lord. So it is a reminder that God provides daily physical sustenance. Now there's a second important concept and that's communion and fellowship. Eating meant friendship and acceptance with another person. Eating with another person meant friendship and acceptance. Eating the bread emphasized the idea of meeting someone face to face over a meal. This, was, this spoke of personal intimate relationship. There were no casual you know, business lunches in that culture where you just whipped into the restaurant, had a quick lunch, closed the deal, and off you were, you were off you went. In ancient Israel, hospitality was a highly esteemed virtue. The guest was sacred. It was an honor to provide for a guest. You did it right. You didn't do it in a hurry. You got to know your guest. You dined with him face to face. So it's a reminder, it's a memorial of Israel's face-to-face -face com communion or fellowship with God. And that's amazing to me that God desires our fellowship. And this whole idea finds its way to the very end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 3. There Yeshua says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens my, the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. So this idea of face-to-face -face fellowship with God is found throughout the whole length of the scriptures from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. God desires our fellowship. Now the frankincense on the table symbolized prayer. It's a reminder that Israel experiences fellowship with God through prayer. And I love Psalm 141, 1 and 2, a Psalm of David, O Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me, give ear to my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be counted as incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. And there's that illustration I love so much. The high priest offering the incense. He's allowing the powdered incense to cascade out of his hands onto the coals that are on the incense altar. The coals ignite and a sweet smelling smoke rises to fill the holy place and then it penetrates beyond the holy place into the Holy of Holies. Remember, that is your prayers. Your prayer is a sweet smelling in incense to God. It surrounds you, but it also penetrates the spiritual, physical barrier and enters into the very throne room of God. So in summary, the table, the bread of the presence, and the incense were a memorial offspring, offering, a memorial offering, a, a reminder that God sustains his people and desires their communion and prayer. Now, what about the messianic significance of the table of showbread? Well, I want to start by describing some rabbinic confusion over this. In the Hertz Pentateuch, on page 329, you read this. The symbolic meaning of the showbread is a matter of conjecture. Maimonides confesses, I do not know the object of the table with the bread upon it continually. And up to this day, I have not been able to assign any reason to this commandment. Now, who is Maimonides? Well, we're speaking of Moses Maimonides, also known as the Rambam. He was the preeminent medieval Jewish philosopher. He was one of the greatest Torah scholars of the Middle Ages. He was acknowledged to be one of the foremost rabbinic arbiters, rabbinical arbiters and philosophers in Jewish history. Here's a statue to Maimonides in Cordova, Spain. He's a very well-known and respected individual. And this is what he said. 
I do not know the object of the table with the bread upon it continually. And up to this day, I have not been able to assign any reason to this commandment. He just is a head scratcher for him. He couldn't figure it out. What is the answer? Well, I believe we can supply the answer. We can supply the answer. Yeshua is the answer. Yeshua is the bread of life. John 6, 35. Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. So just as bread symbolized provision for daily physical needs, so Yeshua, as the bread of life, is the provision for daily spiritual needs. He sustains us daily, and he desires our fellowship through prayer. And then that idea of fellowship is repeated as well as, as part of the messianic significance of the table. That's in Revelation 3.20 that we looked at. Behold, I stand at the door. That's Yeshua. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He desires our fellowship. In addition, Yeshua is a man of prayer. This is, uh, and this is found in Luke 12, 6, 12, excuse me. And Luke 6, 12 is only one of many, many examples. Yeshua was a man of prayer. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Well, I must admit, I've never spent all night in prayer to God. He's got me beat, you guys. He was a man of prayer. Now, Yeshua is depicted by the table in the tabernacle and that he's the bread of life. And the incense on the table portrays the fact that he was characterized by prayer. His life was characterized by prayer. So how about some thoughts of personal application here? First of all, do we set adequate devotions and prayer time aside so that we can grow in our fellowship with Yeshua? Do we do that? Do we seek him often and earnestly in a moment by moment, day by day basis or is he just our life preserver when we're in trouble? You know, do we just limit our prayers to calling for help? Help, Lord, help, Lord. Is that all, the, all, all we do when we pray? Just when we're in trouble and we ignore him the rest of the time? Or does Ephesians 6, 18 and 19 characterize our lives? With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. So what are we, what are we encouraged to do here? We're to be in an attitude of prayer and petition at all times, at work, at school, on the bus, driving on the freeway, walking, whatever we're doing. We should be in an attitude of prayer and, peti and petition and we need to persevere in this, in this um, discipline, the discipline of prayer. We need perseverance. We need to hang in there and stay with it because it's so easy to forget it. Yours truly knows that for sure. So we persevere in this attitude of prayer and petition. And then we pray for our brothers and sisters, whatever their needs are. And we pray for specific, specific prayer requests as Paul laid out here. All right, let's, let's go on to the next application. Are we growing in our knowledge of him through our fellowship with him? Are we growing in our knowledge of him? Because we spend fellowship, we spend face-to-face -face time with him. All right, let's move on then. Let's move on to uh, the lampstand, chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. So we begin with a description of the lampstand in verses 31 to 36. Then you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand and its base and its shaft are to be made of hammered work. Its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers shall be one piece with it. Six branches shall go out from its sides, three branches of the lampstand from its one side and three branches of the lampstand from its other side. Three cups shall be shaped like almond blossoms in the one branch, a cup and a flower, and three cups shaped like almond blossoms on the other branch, a, a bulb and a flower. So for six branches going out from the lampstand. And the lampstand, and in the lampstand, four cups shaped like almond blossoms, its bulbs and its flowers. A bulb shall be under the first pair of branches coming out of it, 
and a bulb under the second pair of branches coming out of it, and a bulb under the third pair of branches coming out of it, for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. Their bulbs and their branches shall be one piece with it, and it all shall be of one piece of hammered work of pure gold. All right, well, no dimensions are given for the, the um, lampstand, but according to Jewish tradition, it was about five feet high and three and a half feet why? This is the Temple Institute menorah that the Temple Institute has made. They plan to use it. They plan to light it in the third temple. This is when it was sitting in the Cardo. It's been moved since, but I was, uh, this is the best picture I've been able to get at, of it when it was in the Cardo. And this is the Temple Institute menorah in a um, studio photograph. So it is a worthy gift for the king. It's made of gold. Here's another artist's rendition of it. A worthy gift for the king, all of gold. Here's another artist as he tries to make sense of the description. The golden candlestick. Here's the Knesset menorah. This menorah is opposite the Knesset across the street, and you can visit when you go to Israel. And you can see it's quite elaborate, well-known landmark in Jerusalem. Now here the menorah was captured in 70 AD by the Romans, and this is a picture of the menorah as the rabbis understand it, as the rabbis have made, um, but it doesn't square with the actual uh, relief that we see on the, on the Arch of Titus. Probably the more, most accurate rendition of the candlestick is from this Roman relief. Here again is the, the relief showing the temple treasures being taken out of the temple. And there is the candlestick. And that's what the Romans thought it looked like. And maybe they even had it there to copy the, um, the, the uh, relief from, to make the relief from, who knows. There it is in the colorized version. And you know, notice it is yellow because it is all gold, all golden candlestick. A worthy gift for the king of kings. Here's a detailed drawing of that particular menorah. This is probably the best rendition of what it looks like. And it has made its way to the Israel's coat of arms as well. So there it is. The best Israel had to offer, all of gold, a worthy gift for the king, worthy for his use. Now the purpose for the menorah is in verse 37. Then you shall make its lamps seven in number, and they shall mount its lamp so, that, that it, so as to shed light on the space in front of it. So here's the Temple Institute menorah in a close up and you see it's got six lamps on either side on the six branches. And then on the center branch itself, uh, there is another lamp often called the shamish or the servant light. So seven, seven lights on the temple, the temple menorah. Now I wanna show you the difference between a temple menorah and a Hanukkiah, uh, a Hanukkiah, a Hanukkah menorah. A Hanukkah menorah has nine lamps, four on each side of the central stem, and then usually uh, a shamish that is raised above and different from the other, other lamps, this time on the uh, central stem. That's a very typical design. So we have nine lamps on a Hanukkah menorah, seven on, a, on the temple menorah. There's a, a Hanukkah menorah. And here, the, the Hanukkah menorah has even made its way onto stamps. They're pretty well known. But this is the menorah that should be used in the, in the uh, temple itself. Now, the menorah was the only soy source of light in the holy place. And that light came from their ancient oil lamps. Now, what was an ancient lamp like? Well. An ancient lamp was simply a small bowl that had been pinched in on one side, often made out of clay, and the wick was laid in the pinched area at the bottom, and then the oil traveled up the wick to the top and it it laid across the side of the, of the bowl, and so the protruding end could be ignited and would provide light. So there you see a very basic oil lamp. Here you see some other versions of the oil lamp as well. As well. You see the reservoir and then a place for the, the wick to come out. All right, now the lampstand was lit at night and extinguished in the morning according to Exodus 30 verse eight. When Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, at dusk, he shall burn incense 
and there shall be perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. And this is also indicated in uh, Exodus 27. Here's a picture of a Levite trimming the lamps on the, one version of the menorah with the straight, uh, straight branches coming out. And here is another Levite trimming the lamps at the uh, curved version of the menorah, like so. Now Exodus 27, 20 and 21 reads, you shall charge the sons of Israel that they bring you clear oil, oil of beaten olives for the light, make the lamp, to make the lamp burn continually, continually. In the tent of meeting, outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall keep it in order from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout their generations for the sons of Israel. So Exodus 27 indicates the same as Exodus 30 verse 8. Also, uh, 2 Chronicles 13, 11. Every morning and evening they burned to the Lord burnt offerings and fragrant incense, and the showbread is set on the clean table, and the golden lampstand with its lamp is ready to light every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Well, so far, everything pretty, seems pretty consistent. However, we don't know if the, uh, because of the wording in the various sections of scripture, was the lamp lit only at night, or was it lit 24 hours a day? And then in 1 Samuel 3, 3, we get another confusing comment. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark, uh, where the ark of God was. Well, here Samuel's getting ready to go to sleep, and this seems to indicate that the lamp went out at night. So there's a great debate going on among the rabbis. Was the menorah lit 24 hours a day? Was it lit only during the day? Was it lit only during the night? And then Josephus says it was 24 hours a day, so which one is right? Well, I think there's another option that reconciles all of this, and this is in Shabbat 22 in the Talmud. There you read, the westernmost lamp would continue burning throughout the day. So here we have a light, one lamp burning throughout the day, after the others were extinguished, and the rest of the lamps burned only at night. That's also found in Menachot 86b. So we have the tabernacle uh, menorah lit 24 hours a day, one, one, uh, one uh, lamp in the, in, during the day and six lamps at night. So all the options are pretty much covered there. Now we come to verse 38 and the accessories for the menorah. Its snuffers and their trays shall be of pure gold. So other articles necessary for the functioning of the lampstand were made with the same attention to quality. Uh, here is a cleaning vessel. And uh, this is a large oil pitcher the Temple Institute has made. And this is a small oil flask. Again, all these for maintaining the menorah. Now the menorah was made of one talent of pure gold. This is in Exodus 25, 39. It shall ma be made from a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. Now a talent is about 75 pounds of gold, about 1,200 ounces. Now, if you take 1,200 ounces times the value of gold, the uh, relative value of gold today, which is about $1,700 an ounce, you come to a Temple Institute menorah that is worth about $2 million, a little over $2 million in uh, in uh, 2020 gold prices, something like that. Of course, gold prices vary a lot, but it's an expensive gift for the king. Now, Rashi has an in interesting comment in his commentary. He says, since Moses found difficulty with it, that is, figuring out how to form the menorah, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to him, cast the talent, equivalent to 64 pounds of gold, into the fire, and it will make itself. So he says that Moses was so confused by the instructions for making the lambs then that God showed him a model in the fire. Now we come to the last verse, verse 40, to a statement that is now being repeated. See that you make them after the pattern for them which was shown you on the mountain. That was first stated in chapter 25, verse 9. When God repeats something, pay attention to it. Moses, do a good job, do an accurate job. This is a warning to Moses to do the best job possible. 
Well, let's see if we can get through the historical, historical significance of the menorah. First of all, it provided light in the holy place. The holy place was never dark. The source of light was either daylight coming through the entryway or light from the lampstand. Whether it be one lamp or six lamps or seven lamps, there was always light in the holy place. And we know that God is light. Daniel 2.22, it is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. Well, what's the darkness there? Psalm 104, 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed in splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. So there the light is associated with creation. And then 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Now there's the darkness again. What does darkness talk about? Well, in the Bible, darkness is a symbol of sin, ignorance, error, and wickedness. In the Proverbs, for example, to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. And so darkness here is evil and perversity and unrighteousness. And then in Proverbs 4.19, the way of the wicked is like darkness. They know, they do not know over what they stumble. So darkness is associated with wickedness. But there is no darkness in the holy place. It's always lit. There is no sin, ignorance, error, or wickedness in the presence of God or in his character. And light is associated with the word of God and or with guidance. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word will guide us through this world. Psalm 18, 28, for you light my lamp. The Lord my God illumines my darkness. When sin, error, ignorance, and wickedness come upon you, God can show you the way out. He can show you the path out using the light. And Proverbs 6, 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. And so there is no sin, error, ignorance or wickedness in God's word. His guidance is trustworthy. So let's finish up with the historical significance of the menorah, the lampstand. There is no sin, error, ignorance or wickedness in God's word. His guidance is trustworthy. And our final topic will be the messianic significance of the menorah or the lampstand. I may go a minute or two over, but it'll be worth it. All right, first of all, Yeshua is the light of the world. John 8, 9, 12, and Revelation 21. John 8, 12. When Yeshua again spoke to them, he said, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Yeshua is our light. John 9, 5, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He can guide, guide us through the darkness. John 12, 46, I have come as a light into the world so that anyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness and sin and error and ignorance and wickedness. Follow the light, follow Yeshua. You don't have to remain in darkness. And then in Revelation 21, we're in the eternal state here. This is the eternal situation. I saw no temple in it, says John. He's talking about the New Jerusalem. There's no temple in the New Jerusalem. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. So we're going to have a glorious uh, time in the Messianic age, in the, I should say, in the eternal state. So the lampstand proclaims the Messiahship of Yeshua. There's no sin, error, ignorance, or wickedness in the person of Yeshua or in the eternal state. So some personal applications, some word of personal application. First of all, the believer is a light, Matthew 5, Ephesians 5, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. So the believer is a light in a dark world. So what should we do? Let your light shine before men 
in such a way they may see your good works. So our light shines when we do good works, works that are consistent with God's character and God's word. And glorify your Father who is in heaven. They will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And then Ephesians 5, 8 and 9. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light, light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. So we are, you and I, are not to be characterized by sin, error, ignorance, or wickedness. Instead, we're to be characterized by goodness and righteousness and truth, the fruit of the light. So there's some questions we need to ask ourselves. Number one, is our light shining before men? Revelation 120, for as the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So churches are lighthouses in this world. And he singles out the churches of Ephesus and he says, therefore remember where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first deeds which will cause men to glorify God. Or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. So the church of Ephesus wasn't doing anything worthwhile. They were losing their light. And if that happens, God says, well, you're useless to me, so I'm just gonna move the lampstand. I'm just gonna remove your witness. Well, the next question, do men see the good deeds that we do and therefore praise God? I remember Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So is our lifestyle righteous, making us stand out in the midst of society, in the midst of our society? You know, that can be hard. We have a very in America, especially a very antagonistic society all around us. But Philippians 2 is still true. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Those are deeds of darkness, by the way, grumbling and disputing. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among, you, among whom you appear as lights in the world. So when we don't grumble and dispute, our light is shining in our society. So are we living as a child of light by turning from sin, error, ignorance, and wickedness? Luke 11, 33 through 36. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it away in a cellar or under a basket, but on a lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. The eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. <clears throat> the Jewish idiom here for a clear eye or a good eye is an eye or a person who is generous and has an unselfish attitude. That's the idea here. If your eye is clear, you have a generous, unselfish attitude. But if it is bad, and there's the opposite, if your eye is bad, it's a selfish, stingy attitude. Then if you have a stingy, selfish attitude, your body is also full of darkness then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. Therefore, your whole body is full of light with no dark in it. <clears throat> it will be wholly illuminated as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. And the fifth question I'm asking here, are we looking to the word of God for guidance through this dark world? Psalm 119, 130. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And now I'm one, my last section here is the prophetic application of the Messiah. We're gonna compare Zechariah 4, two through six with Revelation 11, three and four. So let's take a look at this. Zechariah 2, Zechariah 4, two through six. He said to me, what do you see? Zechariah says, I see and behold a lampstand of all, all of gold with its bowl on the top of it, and its seven lamps on it, with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. And two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking to me saying, what are these, my Lord? And the angel who was speaking to me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, no, my Lord. 
Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So here's the vision that Zechariah sees, the message for Zerubbabel, two olive trees and the oil from the olive, speaking of the Holy Spirit, emptying into the bowl, and then the oil from the bowl to the lampstand, giving light. And so the idea here, the point, is that Zerubbabel will be Holy Spirit empowered to be a light in the world. But now let's take a look at Revelation 11, 3 and 4. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Well, we just got an identification of the olive trees. Here's what John saw, two olive trees. And from the olive trees, the oil signifying the Holy Spirit into the bowl and then into the lampstand and providing fuel for the light. And so the two witnesses, this is a message to the two witnesses, they are going to be Holy Spirit empowered and they are going to shine like two menorahs in the tribulation period. They are the Holy Spirit empowered witnesses of the tribulation period. All right, well, we've come to the conclusion of my lesson today. I've taken you six minutes over. Uh, so I'm glad you were stuck with me for the extra time. We'll see you next session when we move into chapter 26 of the book of Exodus. Thanks for being our students. Lahithra'ot. Lahithra'ot.